Hello and welcome to this edition of ISBNM webinar. We have announced that we will conduct a series of webinars on the theme of adapt, evolve, and succeed. We at them feel that the way forward is to be future ready. And this is why we bring you not only for the ISBM fraternity, for the student community, but also for the world out there, a series of webinars on the theme of Adapt, Evolve and Succeed. The first of this is today. The title is Navigating the New Normal, Managerial Challenges of the COVID Impacted Economy. Now, as we speak, we all know that we are lucky to have our internet connection restored, electricity restored. We are lucky to be alive. A category five super cyclone such as Amphan has wrecked havoc in Bengal. However, the indomitable spirit of Bengal is still alive and we would like to salute to that. Our honorable prime minister has also praised the efforts of the government of West Bengal through the brilliant evacuation efforts as we speak less than 100 lives have been lost considering the huge calamity of the site that is significantly low. The challenges that we face are two-pronged. One is, of course, the aftermath of the Amphan, which requires as people to move to safe quarters. And the second is the COVID-19 pandemic, which requires people to stay indoors. Now, how we negotiate that is going to be the way forward. We have with us Mr. Nilendu Mukherjee, veteran corporate banker with over two decades of experience. Currently, he's working as an executive director and senior relationship banker with Rabobank. Apart from banking, Nilendu is also an avid ultra trail runner. He has participated in a number of full marathons, including New York, Chicago, Berlin. And we also have with us Professor Brita Singh, faculty of ISBNM. She's an expert in communication and soft skill training. She also has a decade of experience. So without any further ado, let us begin our webinar. The Chinese word for crisis, interestingly, has two characters. One is danger, the other is opportunity. We would like to focus on the opportunity. Although the RBI has gone on record saying that in the fiscal year of 2021, the projection of India's GDP is significantly lower, but it has predicted that it will pick up in the second half. Keeping that in mind, I would like to ask Mr. Nilendu Mukherjee, what do you think are the short-term and the long-term areas of recovery of the economy post the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, Avirupa, thank you very much for having me here. It's always great to be back with the ISBNM. Um, I think the last two years, number of times have come for different uh, events. So it is always good to be back, although this time it's an electronic form and not in a physical form, uh, thanks to whatever we are facing right now, or rather, as we call it, a new normal. Um, your uh, question with regard to uh, uh, how the economy is going to come back, if I may, if I may say <laughs> that. Um, <clears throat> It's an unprecedented situation right now. It's very, very challenging and difficult for anybody to say that, well, this is the date when things will become normal. But as we have seen across the globe where uh, other countries, they have faced these challenges. This is not India challenge, this is a global challenge, as you say. Uh, it took some time to bring back the normalcy. Uh, we have to bear with that. Um, there is no quick fix solution to this. The only thing I can say, the brave will wither the storm. Uh, it's a, it's a difficult time for all of us. Uh, we need to we need to uh, have a resolve that once things start, uh, once the curve flatten, as they call it, the curve flatten, as economy starts opening up slowly, 
we need to uh, put our wholehearted effort towards um, getting back to normalcy, getting back to normalcy of opening our business, started doing what we were doing in the past. However, uh, clearly, uh, as we see the numbers coming every other day, uh, mm -hmm. sitting at this moment, it is very difficult for anybody to give a particular date when things will become normal. Uh, but we wholeheartedly believe that at some point of time, this will uh, come down. And I'm, I'm quite uh, sure and quite... Um, hopeful along with the RBI governor that the second half of the year will be quite different for us. If we talk about the specific sector uh, where government is looking at or banking on or um, certainly money but in fiction as well, what do you think are the sectors where revenue will be generated or where it is expected to give returns? Of course, it's a global pandemic, we understand, and each country has to deal with it in its uh, own way. For example, in the, in the Europe, uh, the situations and the um, density and people, even people's mindset are different than in India. For example, uh, as per the 2011 census, uh, the density of population in India is 382 people per square kilometer. And when we talk about social distancing, now that's going to be a huge challenge. We are also talking about uh, the new normal where, you know, uh, a third of the workforce may be put to work and the rest are expected to work from home. Twitter has gone on record saying that it will give the option of working from home indefinitely to some of its employees. I think um, even Facebook uh, CEO has said that today. So in view of this new normal, what do you think specific to India, what are going to be the sectors or the growth areas, the focus areas of recovery? Okay. Um, very clearly, we have to um, start from the basic stuff. When you open the economy, what are the basic stuff? Even when during COVID, there are a few sectors which are working, which are performing. Okay. Uh, what is the one of the most basic need of human beings? eating food right so clearly food and agree is one of the sectors which will uh, which will weather this storm much faster than any other sector because we need to go we need to go out and buy our vegetables we need to go out and buy our groceries those are essential item uh, government very clearly says even during this curfew or uh, or the lockdown you can go out and buy vegetables you can go out and buy your groceries so, so that food and agri sector per se is the first sector which will come out of, or rather, it is not even majorly impacted, if I may, if I may use that word. Uh, and in anything India, in India, forty-three percent of people depend on agriculture, which is huge. Which is, if you're looking at that sector to recover, I think it's a major hurdle. Is already we are looking at a brighter side. Yeah, but you need to keep in mind that you know. Uh, uh, that it is not that easy either, you know. Um, so uh, food and agri is very easy to think about what just you eat, but food and agri sector is a quite a wide uh, definition. Uh, it starts from seeds, fertilizers. It's there in 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 your different kind of grains and oil seeds, animal uh, protein. Then you've got dairy. Then you've got processed food industry. And the most important, the last two uh, thing, which is logistics as well as uh, packaging. Now, while you can, uh, you can during during this entire lockdown situation, in that uh, all other all other parts of the food and agri is working out. But uh, one of the bigger challenges was uh, the logistics part because uh, I'm just giving you an example. A truck full of onion can move from Nasik to Delhi. Now he unloads those onion in Delhi. Can he come back? He cannot come back to Nasik till he gets another essential item loaded in his truck. Right? So, so these are... To make it viable and sustainable. Yeah. So, so there are challenges. There are... Uh, it's not easy. But what I try to say is that relatively, this is one sector which will come back to normalcy much faster. Then, obviously... Uh, the next item comes in my mind is pharma sector. You know, uh, that's something which you cannot ignore, right? You need medicines, you need all other um, 
and stuff which is linked to pharma sector third obviously uh, sectors we which can thrive even through uh, you know distance if i may use that word um IT and ITES. Right, the service this sector. Is sector. Yeah, uh, so uh, these are the three sectors which comes in my mind, which are supposed to do well, which are supposed to recover much faster than any other sector. Uh, once uh, these things come to normalcy, uh, then I think slowly uh, every other sector will, will come back. Uh, you also touched upon um, on, the, on the fact that, you know, work from home and stuff like that. Uh, it's 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 a new revelation uh, for a lot of uh, non it uh, sector uh, uh, employees like myself to to partially enjoy work from home the initial stages and then <laughs> not so much now maybe i'm getting a work from home fatigue now um, <laughs> but um, that is that is that is going to have a profound impact on uh, on lot of people especially uh, for people who uh, uh never thought that you can you can get a decent output even while working from home this will change your outlook towards uh, uh, people when they are uh, into difficulty like you know a pregnant woman um i have seen i have seen in uh, 10 years back when a woman is pregnant almost a year is gone for her career now we can't even think that even when she is pregnant she can very well work from home people who have got ailing parents at home they had to take you know sabbatical for 3 months 6 months to take care of their aged parents now that's not required you can still work from home and those are the things i think acceptance of the fact that people can work from home they can deliver results is a great 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 learning from this whole entire you know covid situation very interestingly said in fact uh, a lot of it and ites companies have actually recorded uh, increased productivity uh, in in the work from home situation, people, they have said that uh, people have put in more efforts, more hours. In fact, uh, the IT or the service sector contributes to 55% of India's GDP, which is uh, again a huge number. If you are looking at uh, developing that sector, then again we are looking at an opportunity rather than a crisis here. There are uh, very important uh, learning from this situation. Uh, as you said, I would like to quote Satya Nadella, who has uh, today, he has said that work from home situation can be good or productive for some time, but if it continues over time, it may not be a, a very good idea. In fact, as, as you said, it can lead to fatigue. So there has to be a balance or negotiation between the two, which brings us uh, to the second question, which is the new managers who are going to be working uh, and spending their work life in the new normal situation. Now, what exactly those are going to be, we are not very sure, but we definitely know that it's not going to be the same set of skills that they have learned, uh, which are going to be as uh, productive. They need to probably use and maybe learn new skills to be more effective and productive in the new normal. So you, uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Mukherjee, since you have been, uh, working with people you've been uh, leading teams what do you what are the expectations that you have as a supervisor or what do you think are the skills that new managers need to learn and the, the old skills they need in the new well um, my answer might be a little <laughs> not very interesting or not very encouraging uh, because I believe that the basic managerial skills remain same whether you are uh, in a COVID situation or you are in a non-COVID situation. Uh, to my mind, the three major qualities which we'll certainly like to see in anybody are uh, very broadly speaking is morality, courage, and empathy, if I may use those three words, which are very close to my heart. You know, you may you may learn a lot of skills, you know, technical skills, number skills, a uh, lot of uh, textbook uh, learning, etc., etc. But if you do not have these three things in you as a manager, whatever be the situation, you'll never succeed. You know, if you are not, uh, if your integrity is not to the highest standard, if your morality is not to the highest standard, if you are not doing the right things, then you are uh, obviously not. Um, 
going to succeed in life. And immediately with that, what comes is courage. Uh, these are very interlinked. You know, you need to have the courage to take risk. Uh, uh, risk means it should be a calculated risk within the boundaries defined by your organization. Uh, you need to uh, take up challenges. You cannot shy away from challenges. Uh, you need to uh, you need to at times open your um, and say. Many times we come across situations that are not so uh, not so great, or we know that things are not happening in the right way. You need to have the courage to come up and speak your mind, say what is right and say what is not right. Um, and third and the most important, I think, empathy. You know. If you do not have empathy towards your own team members, if you do not have empathy towards your own organization, then you will never be empathetic towards your clients, towards your customers. If you are not empathetic towards your clients and customers, they will realize that you are just here to do business. You are not here to build relationship. And if you, if you are not building relationship, then you're not doing business. The long-term business only happens when you build relationship, when you build connections. So those things, those broad things don't change. Only during this time, what I keep telling people that you need to build resolve that and have faith in yourself that you can deliver. You can come over these difficult times. Also, what needs to be inculcated during this time is you will get, you know, since you're working from home or you are you are getting some more time. I'm just giving you an example. Typically on a regular day, my travel time to my office and back is close to one and a half hours, if not more. So I'm saving that clear one and a half hours. So that yeah. incremental one and a half hours, how I am utilizing. Am I learning new skills? It can be any damn skill. It can be learning a new language. It can be learning a new coding system. It can be learning or getting into an online course of a new way of marketing uh, you know, consumer products. There are so many uh, resources available in the internet. Just use that. That's number one. Number two, within your own business line, think what are the things which you used to do which were not very efficient and how you can increase your efficiency. Apart from those three broad qualities, what I encourage everybody during this time when they have got extra one and a half hours to two, two hours during the day, are they applying themselves? Are they thinking about business? Are they thinking about the client? Are they thinking about how to do business better? Are they improving themselves? Are they finding out what are the gaps in their own, own uh, skill set? Are they improving on them? This is a great time to build those skill sets. I, I think don't know it's a that addresses Perfectly, it addresses perfectly. I think the key thing that, that has come out is introspection and making the most of the resources that we have, be in terms of time, be in terms of any other resources, uh, which is an interesting part which will lead to the, which automatically lead, uh, leads me to ask the next question. And this is both to you and to Professor Brita Singh. So, in this new normal, as you say, that uh, you're expected to work from home with a new set of expectations, new skills. Now, what do you think are, uh, the, in terms of soft skills and etiquettes, what are the things that are required? Say, for example, uh, as you said, like apart from IT and ITES sectors, a lot of other sectors who were not accustomed to working from home, suddenly when they're expected to learn a new uh, technology and apply it, what uh, automatically goes to the back seat is the presentability or uh, your etiquettes. Now, a lot of, I have heard from friends uh, in the corporate sector, they have said that, you know, people have started attending meetings in their home clothes, in their pajamas. So uh, now that was something completely new and it was not, uh, uh, people didn't know what to do. Uh, for example, working at odd hours, people calling up at uh, that they will be 24 seven online. So even that uh, has to be, you know, has to have a certain kind of structure or uh, so both to Professor Brita Singh and Mr. Mukherjee, I would like to ask uh, maybe Professor Brita Singh to begin with, uh, what are the etiquettes do you think uh, that is required in this new normal for the managers? I think when you're working online as it is, you need to be very careful how you're presenting yourself. 
Because if you remember that when anybody looks at the screen, what they can only see is your face. There is no distraction. Whereas when you're standing face to face, there are people walking past, there could be pictures, there could be noises, but here the concentration is entirely on you. So you have to ensure that you present yourself in the best possible way. Wearing pajamas is going to make you lethargic in, your, in the way that you behave. Because you need to be attentive, you need to be on the ball, you cannot lag behind. So, you know, getting into your office clothes or getting into something formal changes your entire attitude as to how you speak, how you sit, how you talk to somebody. So I think we need to be more careful. Again, I think a lot of people feel that, oh, great, I'm going to work from home. So that means it's holiday time. Actually, <laughs> It is you, the eye. I mean, people are looking at you because they can actually track what work you're doing and how you're doing. It. So it's not as though you can say that this I'm working online so I can suit myself, especially those who are interacting with customers. You have to be available for them because that's why you're there. So working at from home needs you to be even more correct in your etiquette than before being even more clear in how you communicate. And as Nilendu said earlier, empathy is really the key here. Because when you're dealing with other people, you have to understand that everybody has problems. If you take today, because of the cyclone, a lot of us didn't have internet connection, electricity, all kinds of things. So I have to, if you're the manager or the leader or the team member, you have to take into account that different people have different problems. There are people who have their children locked up at home with them and the children are not used to being locked up. They've got this boundless energy and they, are, they want to use it in one way or the other. So they could very well be photobombing your session. But the other person has to understand, okay, he's working from home. He's working, never mind the photobombing. But is he getting his message across? Is he working? Is he able to do so correctly? And as Nilendu said, this is the time it's very important that you keep up with technology and look at how work is being done in other countries as well as in India. Recently, there was a survey of 370 CFOs who said that working in India and working from home has worked out very well. But they still felt that it was necessary to, to make a combination of so many days at home and so many days at the workplace. Because that in-person uh, communication, in-person experience is at the core of communication and also at the core of your business when you're speaking to somebody. That's wonderfully said, uh, Brita. I think uh, it, it sums up very well what are the etiquettes necessary. Uh, but I would still like uh, to ask Mr. Mukherjee if you would like to add something, especially I remember when you said that uh, you know, commute time is less, uh, which, is, um, which is what brings me to the old joke of Indian standard time. When we say that you know, in India, if we have a meeting at 10, it usually begins at 10.15. And uh, well, here, and the, the excuse that is most often given is uh, traffic. But here, if a meeting is scheduled, online meeting is scheduled at 11, it means that you have to be online you know, five minutes before rather than one minute later. So that punctuality also has to be absolutely there. And there's no excuse. You cannot, I mean, unless there's, of course, uh, a connectivity problem, a fatality, that's a different issue, but that's an emergency. But otherwise, there cannot be an excuse. So, Mr. Mukherjee, would you like to add uh, maybe a little bit on uh, what Brita said on the etiquette part? Let me give you my own example. I think that's best. So, um, uh, when from 25th, we started having this work from home. Uh, first two days was complete disarray. You know, I don't know how to manage things. It was going quite everywhere. Uh, because I've never done this. For me, this was first time. Then I had to realize that, you know, the fact that it has gone in my head, I'm working from home, that's a problem. So I have to think that I'm not working from home. It's a regular working day, working in office. 
So the after I think the third day, what we started doing is, and a bunch of us, we got up at the right time, did our exercises as if it's a normal walking day, uh, did our exercises, um, do the shaving, take the bath, everything at time, as if we are starting the office at nine. Dress up in your regular work attire, start your day, write down all the things what you need to do, exactly like the way you have done it in your regular office day. Sit in front of, uh, make a particular place within your home, which is your workspace. Make a workspace, sit there, do your work, make the calls as if you're working in a regular. The issue is that if you don't have the discipline, then you will not get that productivity. It is very easy to say, oh, work from home, productivity. Good. Productivity is good in work from home because number one, and I strongly believe in India, the major issue is traffic. You spend so much of uh, hours in traffic and if you not have that traffic, your productivity is good. Number two, you get less distracted by gossip, by people calling, going for a coffee, you know, generally chit chatting. These are the things which are not there, right? Every time you cannot pick up the phone, talk to somebody, you will have a phone fatigue. Now if the phone rings, I said, oh yeah, another call. You know, those issues you keep facing, right? So what happens, your distractions are much lesser. So you finish off your, the same email, which you usually have taken an hour to draft and to write. And now it's happening much faster. This is the, 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 the good side of it. The bad side of it is you cannot get information very fast. Earlier was to happen, you're doing something, you need four data points, you stand up, Ask four guys just by shouting in the office, can I get this data? Can I get that data? They tell you, ah, it is this, 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 this. I said, okay, you sit down and start writing. Now you have to call that guy. That guy is busy in another call. He calls you back. It takes enormous amount of time in that. So th that, those are the things which are the challenges which we need to now uh, get uh, ourselves used to. But the, the, the key thing is, if you want to be productive during a work from home situation, you need to follow strict discipline. The same discipline which you are working, uh, which you are using in your office hours. Another very important asset I must to highlight. Remember, when you are in office environment, you are physically moving from one place to another place. You are doing a lot of stuff which you don't record, you just go and tell either your supervisor or your senior or your colleague, they all know what, you, what is keeping you busy. Now suddenly nobody can see you. So when I don't see you, I don't know what you are doing, period. Unless I see an email from you which tells me what you are doing. So your level of communication inside the organization need to, uh, need to be much higher level because nobody can see you. You are talking to five clients. How do I know? I can only know when you send me those five call reports. Maybe in a regular time when in a regular office, you don't need to do that. And I'm sure within student also the same thing applies. You know, a professor can see you what you're doing, but <laughs> professor don't see you. We don't know what you're doing. So increase the level of communication. Tell. Doing good thing is important. I keep telling people doing good thing is important, but telling people that you are doing good things is even more important. Extremely well um, put, Mr. Mukherjee. I should definitely say this. Uh, one is the mindset and the discipline and self-motivation that working from home means home is just the physical space that you're in. Working is should or should be the focus here and very important is uh, what we have been talking about the communication of what you are doing extremely well said and this is for everyone out there uh, it is not important it, i mean it is extremely important that you work but it is equally or even more important now to let people know your progress so you know do not expect to people to understand what you are doing now it is more important to let people know and do not procrastinate on uh, communication. I think that's a very important lesson to be learned from here. Uh, but uh, 
just going back a bit on what you were saying, you know, the, about the distractions. You know, when you're working in an office, it often happens that you take a smoking break, you take a coffee break, and you know, you chit chat with your colleague. And well, uh, I would say this: uh, that these probably might seem like a distraction, and uh, and minus that, uh, maybe uh, it seems quantitatively the productivity has increased. However, I would uh, like to point out that networking like physical networking, human networking, is an unpredictable source of opportunity or of possibilities. You know, when you chit chat with your colleague or say you are in a conference and um, there's a coffee break and then you just happen to have that one person taking a sip of coffee whom you think you have a vibe. Now, what is vibe? You cannot really, it is difficult to translate vibe um, across a uh, technological interface. It is only you know, person to person human connect. And you have that vibe, you go up to the person and have a cup of coffee and you never know. The next business deal may be struck right there or your race or your switch. You know, those kind of things which is exclusive to human networking is going to be you know, absent or minimized, I may say. Uh, but then, like you said, it again opens up the possibility of connecting to the whole world thanks to the internet. So how will you, you know, balance those two out, you know, those two face-to-face -face networking versus virtual networking? What are the pros and what are the cons? How would you negotiate those two? See, uh, we human beings are social animals. So there is no doubt that, you know, uh, physical networking has an immense value uh, to uh, all of us. I go back to a learning which I uh, had long, long time ago, uh, around 1994, 95, I attended a, a customer service training when uh, I was just started my career. And there's a UK company came and they talked about how to improve customer service. And one of the things they talked about is how British Airways uh, officials, when they booked the ticket over the counter, were, how, what the principle they follow, they were uh, when they take the credit card or, or the money for the ticket they try to you know touch the finger and when they give it back they again try to touch the finger and this has been uh, being uh, you know uh, a lot of scientists work on this that uh, touch actually gives a much more positive feeling a uh, human being like touch um, i know there are a lot of uh, negative touch and those things have come up over the last um, for some years and there are some right touch, wrong touch, etc. I'm not getting there, but it's important that we, we like that touch. Um, I was telling somebody a few days back that a lot of neurons are there in, in and around our shoulder. And uh, that's why when somebody holds us on our shoulder, we feel comfortable. We feel that this person is close to me. So these are the things which are very, very important in our, in our life. We cannot, uh, and this is how we are built. Our, our physiology is like that, you know. Uh, uh, we, uh, when we see a person in, uh, in front of us, it's not the face, it's the whole body language which makes us uh, understand whether this person is liking my words, whether he's listening to me or not, etc. So there are a lot of things which will be completely missed if we move into a complete virtual world. Uh, I'm just giving you another example. Uh, uh, we have several um, meetings in our office. There are few meetings which nobody wants to attend. You know, those are the meetings which are the most boring, most uh, meeting, you know. Now those meetings have become virtual. I see everybody joining. The whole band joins this meeting two, three minutes before the meeting starts. So I once called one of those guys who is the most, what should I say, uh, you know, the, uh, the reluctant, the most boisterous of the lot who try to skip all the meetings, you know. I said, uh, Nilendu, I'm, there's a, Nilendu, there's a question which has appeared in the chat where people, when you were talking about touch, yeah, they're saying how employers, employees, because they're working at home and because of the distancing and because of the virtual platform that they're working on, they feel distressed and abandoned. The word used is abandoned. How can, and the, how can the senior make up for this loss? Empathy would be one of them, but what else could he do to make the junior not feel abandoned? 
which is a very very valid and a, a very uh, you know important question uh, and i will i will completely uh, um, relate to this because even at this stage i at time feel abundant if i don't see too many emails coming if i don't get a call if i don't talk to people over phone for a very long period of time then i feel abundant you know there is no quick fix solution to this as a senior manager it is the leader i'll not say there is a difference between a senior manager and a leader a leader is the person who understand this before he has been told that his team members are feeling abundant he needs to go out reach out to individual it not necessary that he need to talk about the transaction the deal the client it can be just a general chit chat of 3 4 minutes how are you are you getting your groceries right is there any covid cases in and around your place topical i think you were just the, the example that you were giving if you could just complete the example i think that could actually uh, you know validate what you were trying to say that you know you called up a person who was reluctant to attend a, a meeting because it was all about numbers and crunching numbers and analytics but if, when you called up what did you say why did you want to attend that meeting because he was he was he said there is at least one abandoned. opportunity there is one opportunity for me to connect with you all forget the the, the thing this is an opportunity to connect coming back to uh, thank you very much for reminding me that the feeling of that i am in abundant nobody is calling me nobody is asking how am i doing you know so if nobody is doing that uh, okay now everybody every leader every senior manager is not same everybody will not do that then you have to take it on yourself as a junior guy if nobody is calling me if, then i will call i will talk i will tell them what i am doing I, i will think that this is an opportunity for me to showcase my performance even during this difficult time so nobody that answers so yeah. that answers a question we had whether communication should be employer or employee driven and you have said it's both ways both ways absolutely everyone has to be even more proactive in terms of communicating because like we said we are we are social people you know we are not machines i mean number crunching analytics those are great things but it can be done by machines also in fact uh, even probably uh, if you use technology and the technology moves uh, to the next generation it will probably be even more efficient you know but what machines cannot be will not ever be able to replace is the need for us to connect need for us to socialize which uh, brings us uh, to uh, the question of the managers the the, the ground bed of the managers which is yes brita has a question I I have a numerous other questions here yep. and they all ask the same thing and this is for Nilendu the question is there is a silver lining everywhere always it's like the yellow brick road in the wizard of oz now what are the opportunities in terms of profiles jobs which sectors post the pandemic for graduates for our new graduates what are the opportunities which would be there or could be there i must say this is a very difficult question for me to answer um now let me th- i have not th- thought about it but uh, obviously um the sectors which i mentioned in the past which will come back very strongly uh those sectors remains to be uh, the the key sectors where people will find uh, more a uh, Uh, more easier to move into uh, um there are a lot of effort uh, i understand government is giving on this enter make in india story uh, so i believe that post pandemic we'll see more and more um uh, industries which will try to become self reliant uh, to my mind uh, anything to do with um, health and medical will be one of the very very key sector we will see significant amount of growth in that area our uh, uh, overall expenditure on health is abysmally low as compared to other sectors where we where we spend say for example defense and others so i will see with this covid there'll be more expenditure 
uh, or, or more capital flowing into health and health related sectors. So that is a very, very key sector to, to keep in mind. Uh, health means not just becoming a doctor. Health is a very, again, it's a very expensive sector. It is a uh, hospital, it is IT related to health, it is, you know, no other um, automation related to health. health. Uh, engineering part of the health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you will find, you know, find. So just, I'm just giving an example. Suddenly we realize the number of uh, ventilators across the globe is very low. And even a company, a, a Formula One car racing company, they yes. are thinking of coming up with a ventilator. So, mm. so this is just giving you uh, the direction, you know. So anything to do with health, that sector is going to boom because we have realized that, you know, our, um, we never, we never thought about that this kind of pandemic can hit us. Uh, while there are some, uh, uh, for, uh, some leaders who had got uh, significant foresight, they talked about pandemic about uh, three, four years back, but the realization is very hard now. So that is one sector which I, which I clearly see is um, uh, going to, going to flourish a bit. However, the traditional sectors will also remain uh, strong after some point of time. I'm just giving you an example. You, somewhere during the discussion at the very beginning, Avrupa said that, you know, there'll be less number of people in the factories, right? So how to tackle it? I'm just giving you a live example of one of my clients. They used to run only one shift in factory. Now they're having 50% of the workforce in the factory. So they've started running two shifts. Right. right. And by Two shifts, they're achieving, they are actually achieving that almost 90% capacity utilization. And how this is happening, these are the improvisation we will be doing. So I don't think that, you know, people will no longer work in factory. It can't happen that way, you know. The traditional um, uh, sources of employment will still be there, but there will be new uh, opportunities will keep coming up. Okay, I, and as I understand it, uh, you know, Azuna virus like the COVID-19 has its lifespan. I mean, it has, uh, like other viruses, like for example, HIV, we are living with it. Uh, although it's not a zoonotic virus, but most of the zoonotic virus flu, uh, the Ebola, um, all these viruses have a particular lifespan. I mean, it will live its span. Maybe, yes, as you said, very importantly, that the traditional sectors will not go away. Maybe it will take the hit for two, three years, but then it will bounce back. It has to bounce back. And as you said, the, the new sectors that are full of opportunities are the health sectors, which is uh, the pharma sector, which is going to be uh, on focus, which um, again, uh, let me just uh, take a step back and talk about uh, uh, the, where it came from. Like Brita said that a lot of our young graduates, they are raising this question. Now, here I, I want to... Uh, talk about the, the, the education system that has also gone a complete makeover, if I may say so. Uh, the shift has been from right from the pre-primary to the graduates uh, and postgraduates and beyond have shifted to online mode of teaching. While it was a completely necessity, uh, it has its own uh, values. It has own, I would like you to also about, you know, uh, can again, like every other sector, can be a balance between the two because you see, uh, education is not only about getting information or, uh, you know, learning only the academics. You know, for example, I would talk about myself. I remember the times or the, the values taught or the teachings that were beyond the class, you know, beyond the syllabus. When I went out of the class to bump into my uh, favorite professor and ask her uh, about a question about maybe my life. You know, maybe a problem that is facing me, which is not really fixing that problem or talking about even airing that problem with my favorite professor, which I look up to, which I consider my mentor or someone who uh, has my best interest in their mind. And that actually has made uh, me a better um, uh, human being or a better uh, skillful person in terms of learning uh, social skills than only the academic part, which can be taught online also. Uh, you know, a brick and mortar classroom has its own charm. You know, if I would like both Professor Rita Singh and Mr. Nirendra Mukherjee to maybe say a very short, uh, very short uh, 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 sentences about, you know, the classroom teaching versus online teaching. How do you see it? 
the in person experience is unmatched by virtual classes it 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 can't be you can't compare the two you know there is a huge degree of spontaneity when you are taking class yourself and you're standing there and you actually walk up to a student address a remark to a particular student ask a question that kind of informality and flow of conversation cannot be replaced by teaching online this uh, this teaching online is more a lecture i give a lecture or you teach or somebody teaches whatever it is and then you uh, sort of the questions come up but there isn't a, the, the flow isn't there the continuity isn't there the it's not a casual thing but there is a warmth which is created within the classroom because all of them when you said that yes. you know a managerial skill is not only about crunching numbers it is about learning empathy learning values which are going to last in the long run uh, and that cannot be uh, taught online and of course we have to have this uh, the online facility which is which has its own uh, we cannot ignore technology we have to uh, embrace technology but exclusive online training probably for managerial skills uh, if i may specifically narrow it down to managerial skills it's probably not enough would you like to add to this mr mukherjee Uh, i think you both of you have said a lot about it i'm completely i have another question from uh, uh, people who are joining I... in okay yeah please go ahead so oh, okay so so the only thing i will say that uh, uh, it's uh, nice to be online but we always know online is very cut and dry online is very to the point specific and it's over what online misses is the anecdotal stories which only happen when we sit across when we talk with each other in a uh, classroom environment i have seen in lot of classroom environment lot of new stories come and remember the i strongly believe the most of the learning which we get are from stories not from the theories the theory gets applied into a story and then the story has been told to us then it i remember the story and when i remember the story i remember the theory absolutely very very well said prithvi you were saying something about the questions yes again there are a number of questions but the one, but the one of them is that how in this when you're working virtual uh, virtually how do you measure individual performance is it easier to measure it or is it more difficult and how do you do it Uh, you know both yes and no uh, because uh, um, uh, at times what happens like you know when it comes to a uh, virtual world uh, as i mentioned at the very beginning i only come to know about somebody's performance when they let me know what they are doing so that has the positive side now there are a few people who are um, extrovert they are intelligent they get it very quickly and they start bombarding your mailbox with every day with five email six email knowing what exactly has happened how things are moving uh, but there are people who are also working hard but they are not uh, you know they have not been able to change themselves and they are not able to show up regularly on what they are doing and what they are not doing how they are performing etc so at times i feel that maybe i am missing out on them and as a leader it's my responsibility to then reach out to everybody to find out what exactly is happening and uh, you know uh, again performance management is different in different segments of an of an organization if you are on the front line sales guys it is much easier to uh, uh, monitor performance because you are talking to client you are directly getting the numbers because they are very number driven right this amount of sales this amount of interest earning this amount of you know a delivery is this amount of collections is very easy the challenging part is more for a person who say suppose the hr hr is not by that number you know does that hr lady or the hr man is reaching out to their employees to find out their well being 
Now, this is very difficult to, you know, judge till you come to know. So, you know, end of the day, what is very, very important uh, for an individual, I'll come back to the same thing, communicate, communicate, communicate. Don't feel shy. Don't think that, well, this is very simple. Do I need to tell my boss that I've done? What's the harm? At the max, he will just delete that email, right? But you said, you do your bit so that everybody comes to know what you're doing. Also, remaining uh, very, very focused, like the way you're focused on your, on your clients, on your work, on, uh, you're so disciplined. This part, the communication part also need to be put under discipline. That end of the day, I will try to write a short email about the most important things, whatever has happened throughout the day and send it to my supervisor. And, you know, if two, three days you do that and the fourth day suddenly I don't get an email, it has also become my habit of receiving that email, right? When I don't get the email, I pick up the phone, up. is everything fine? I haven't heard anything from you. So, so basically strengthening and focusing on communication within the group is what is important. Absolutely. It's one of the key areas, I believe. That is the key thing. It, it has been coming you know, up even, over, even over when, again. And, and this is something which should be there even during a regular course of time. Uh, and this is something which I have told, two things I keep telling uh, people a lot. One, uh, if you don't tell me, I never know what you are doing. Number one. Number two, if you don't ask things from me, I may not give it to you. And there's a very old, old saying that, you know, mom gives milk to the kid only when the kid cries, right? When he or she starts crying, mom knows, okay, that person is hungry, that kid is hungry. So right. I need to see the hunger. You need to come and tell me, right? That I have done one, two, three, four, five. I want to do seven, eight, nine, ten, but I'm not getting the opportunity. Give me the opportunity. So very important is the projection part. I mean, if of course you work uh, very rightly said in the qualitative analysis. So for example, the training department. It is uh, it's difficult for the training department to quantify their achievement. I mean, uh, it's more based on how you know the qualitative uh, part that uh, someone else will deliver basis their training. So then let, again, let me add, focus is on. Let me. Let me add that there is a comment made by Professor Jayaraman, where he says that performance manager, man, uh, management is of vital importance at this time to measure what people are doing and how they are doing it. Oh. This is from Professor Jayaraman at the Nande campus. Thank you, Professor Jayaraman. I think it's very important uh, that you said how part uh, you know, that is what I think uh, Professor uh, uh, Brita Singh wanted to highlight. And what, he has to said actually, what he has said actually is there are many instances of employees misusing such flexible arrangements. Do companies have a robust performance management system to monitor performance? I think Milindu has already addressed that. I will also add one line to that, you know, uh, uh, I have a bigger issue with that uh, statement where he's saying that people misuse. Yeah, people do misuse, but then I will take the entire blame on me as a leader if one of my team, team members are misusing. Two aspects, number one, then I have not taken the right person. I have not groomed him right. And number three is that I am not keeping a close eye on my own employees. I am a, I'm a, I'm a leader, I'm a manager. I will never put the blame onto my team member. I will always put the blame onto me. It is, it is the leader who drives the organization. I have worked under fabulous leaders. I was worked under a leader who always told me that you don't need to come and seek permission for leave. You go whenever you feel like. I have complete trust on you and I know you will deliver. That gives me enormous amount of responsibility and ownership of my own job, right? And, and he, I've seen him, he is brutal. He is brutal when people have not performed. 
So it's again the way the leader controls. If somebody is not doing things which are right, the leader need to identify it at the very beginning before it becomes a bigger problem for the entire team. We always say one rotten apple make the whole basket of apple rotten. Yes. If you have identified a rotten apple, as a leader, it's my responsibility to keep, on, keep myself glued onto my team members. Every manager has to be that. And they have to identify the rotten apples very early and pick them out and throw them out. We need to be True, very good. And the rotten apple, if it's there, it will take whatever uh, leeway there is. Because this uh, pandemic situation gives us a different uh, uh, situation where you can take advantage of it. But even in the time that's, uh, that is normal, even there, they would have taken advantage of whatever leeway there was. So in order to uh, identify and root out the cause as a leader, you need to take more initiative, more responsibility, and uh, ensure that's that the, the value system is... Yeah, that is, that is what is leadership is all about. Leadership is all about motivating people, encouraging a, a leader who goes out and strikes deal. To my mind, he's a worker. He's not a leader. A leader is a person who encourages, infuses the learning which he has got over the last 10, 12, 15, 20 years into his team members, encourages team members to become another leader. A, a true leader is that person who change a manager or a worker into a leader. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Mukherjee. I, I think with that, that, we would like to uh, come to the conclusion of our uh, session here. Uh, very, uh, what, what, is, um, what we have learned from this is, number one is, uh, you talked about the value system or the ethics of this doing business. That is going to be one thing that has remained constant and it will be, constant over the years. And the other thing that you talked about is dis and discipline and self-motivation and taking ownership and initiative. Now, if um, all of that somehow uh, I find there's a, if I can say it's an analogy, it's like running a marathon. And I think you would be able to better say that, you know, all of that, yeah, the, you know, the result, the self-motivation, the, the discipline, and of course, um, you know, the, the ethics, that uh, that you promised to yourself needs to be there for running a marathon. If you just talk about before we end this session a little bit about your marathon running experience, because of course it will not be the same. Right? I mean, uh, I don't know about uh, uh, the sporting uh, world, but I'm sure you will be able to tell more. You know, what is the future and what, how do you see yourself as a runner? Okay, what I'll do, I have. Uh, can I get two minutes? I need two to three minutes for this. What I'll do here is I will just tell. Uh, how I prepare myself for a particular race from the time I have decided that I will run that particular race. And just, I will request everybody who are there listening to this whole session, convert that into their own life goal and follow the same principles. Okay. So I decided Yeah, you know that the resolve comes in you. You feel like you don't know no negativity. You think that I'm going to do this. Nobody can stop me doing this. I'm doing the right thing. I'm taking all the necessary um, uh, training, what is required. I'm taking care of my body. I'm taking care of my food. I also went to a nutritionist to have my proper food. I started practicing my long runs on Sundays using the same kind of food which will be given to the aid stations in that marathon. So that amount of preparation I'm doing, I knew they will be giving me cheese sandwich, chips, Coke, 
So I was eating all those food when I'm running here in Mumbai. So that I, that I will not keep any stone unturned. I will make myself ready for the rest to the T. Nutrition, physical conditioning, mental conditioning. Remember, during this period, you will have set back. February 21st, early morning, I got a call from my wife. My mom has suddenly passed away. It was a huge shock for me. I went rushing to Calcutta, seven to eight days. I can't even think anything. No training, nothing. I was devastated because it came bolt from a blue. It was, it just shaken my whole thing. On the eighth day, my wife told me, you need to go out for a run. In Calcutta, in Salt Lake Newtown, that Sunday, I think eighth or ninth day, that Saturday or Sunday, I ran 50 kilometers. My wife and our dog were the only two accompanying me, you know, in the car. I realized that come what may, I cannot move away from my target, my target. And this is February and April is around the corner. Very next day, I got back into training. I went back to my coach. I said, keep updating my schedules. I got back to my coaching. On the race day, after 40 years, it started snowing in Croatia. I was not ready for snow. I never ran in snow. I ran in extreme heat. I ran in uh, rain, but never ran in snow. I was struggling at that point of time, which was around 30 kilometers already into the race. One gentleman came beside me, he was a Croat guy. He came and told me, you're from India, because somewhere it was written India. I think in my beep it was written in India. I said, yes. You're struggling. You never ran on a, on, on a, and there's an uphill in a, in a snow situation. I said, no, he just told me one thing, boy, he was quite older than me. He was at least 10, 15 years older than me. He said that, boy, this is suffering. And remember, every suffering has an end. Just hang in there. Just hang in there. I slowed down. I knew the target time, which I had in mind. I will not be able to do it, but I will finish it. I started slow steps. I reached to the top of the peak, which was the Uchka, which is the highest peak in Croatia. And then I started coming down. And the rest is history. I finished the race <clears throat> well within time. One of the most high point of my running career. So that was my goal. This was my preparation. I don't find any difference between office, between your personal life, between your other goals. The theory is do your research, prepare well, give you a hundred percent and be mentally prepared. There will be setback. There will be new hurdles. Keep on coming on your way. Have faith in yourself. If you are focused, if you are disciplined, if you're taking your right uh, training and if you're listening to your coach, then you will succeed. That was so inspiring, Mr. Mukherjee. I must say this. This story, you know, sort of sums up uh, uh, the entire session, I believe, you know, navigating the new normal. This is the resolve I think we should all carry with ourselves. I think stories tell so much, you know, in the data, the data points, all, everything, actually, we want to hear stories. And this is exactly, uh, this is what I believe all our viewers out there who are, thank you very much, viewers. You are, your great response actually uh, bolsters up our spirit. And we believe this Adapt, Evolve, and Succeed series of webinars will be a success. You've already proved that. Thank you very much for your responses. And Mr. Mukherjee, I mean, we cannot thank you enough. Uh, for all that you have said, and especially that last story, from which one uh, line I must uh, think is very important, especially the situation is that, uh, you know, boy, there is suffering, and you must know that all sufferings must end. Unfortunately, we, yes. we you know, we all went with, uh, with more about a crisis, right? But then we need to know that this zoonotic virus to for the next, I don't know, five, seven years, we are think of it as a prime enemy and go to world war against it. But then that I think more importantly, we should focus as much as 
you know, making peace with its existence in our lives. We have to go on with our work. Maybe, you know, with, with, with basic sanitization deals, drills, or basic, you know, some, we have to make some changes in our lives. We, but we must go out and out with our lives, with our work, and we must make peace with the virus. If we, if I may quote uh, from War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, uh, the most resilient of warriors are two, time and patience. Yep. I think these are words of wisdom. And with that, I would like, I would request, uh, and I would like Brita to please uh, sum up the session. And thank you very much, our viewers, our uh, numerous uh, ISBM fraternity for being with us today and making this a resounding success. Thank you very much. We will be looking forward to your participation in the next uh, series. Thank you, Nilindu. Thank you so much for all that you have said, especially in your last account of your running. I think the lessons that you learned from there, which are determination, preparation, be ready for change and for the unexpected, optimism and faith. I think these are things which can guide us in life. If they can be applied to every part of our life. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Thank you, Abhinupad, for doing a brilliant job as a moderator. And thank you to all the people.